So uh, we are delighted to have uh, Professor Dale Ivan from New York Theological Seminary, uh, Peter Fan uh, from Georgetown, yes, University, uh, Professor Olufunke Adebayo from University of Lagos in Nigeria, Professor Jehu Hansels from Emory University, uh, Professor Shobona Shanka from hey. Stony Brooks, yeah, University in New York. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have yet uh, Peter Paris. Uh, probably he might uh, join us. Uh, he kindly accepted to be here this afternoon, uh, and then he was going to speak and then leave because he's traveling tomorrow. So we hope that. Yeah. Yes. So hopefully uh, he might join us at the end. Okay. So. Uh, let me just invite Adele to the podium. Thank you, Afe. Well, it's a bittersweet task we have. The occasion of this panel is the passing of our friend and colleague, Lanam, Laman Sane, on, back on January 6th. I got an email early in the day from Anthea Butler, who had already been contacted by religious news services. And uh, I was quite shocked, like many of you were, when you heard that Laman had passed. And one of the things I felt was like I'd lost a great friend and I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. So we've all lost a scholar and a friend and that's the bitter part, but the sweet part is we're here to celebrate for a few minutes his life and his heritage. One of the things Laman often said had summoned him to Christian faith was the empty tomb and the belief in the resurrection of the dead. He told me once he truly believed in both the ancestors and the saints. Well, he's now among them and I'm sure he's listening in on our conversation. So, Laman, you might not agree with everything we're going to say. You very rarely did. But it's you we're honoring, and we do ask you to listen to what we have to say. And you can expect us to be struggling and working with you and remembering you for a long time to come. Nine years ago, Akin Akinata edited a book titled A New Day. It's going to show up here in a moment. Essays on World Christianity in Honor of Laman Sane. Several of us who are here contributed essays to that volume. I went back and looked at the Festschrift as I was preparing my remarks for today. One of the words that shows up in several chapters by various authors is frontier. Laman Sane was someone who was intentional about living and working along various frontiers in his life. Regarding Sane's contribution to Christian Muslim dialogue in particular, Andrew Walls in his for foreword to A New Day wrote, it was the area of the frontier, geographical, intellectual and spiritual, where Christians and Muslims mingled, that Laman's work as a teacher and practitioner lay. That certainly shows up in both piety and power, Muslims and Christians in West Africa, and beyond jihad, the pacifist tradition in West African Islam. But there are other frontiers that Laman sought to cross. Laman sought to cross. Abolitionist abroad, American blacks in the making of modern West Africa, was a serious effort to cross back over the frontier of the black Atlantic in a freedom ship while making a larger case for an anti-structural reading of the modern missionary movement and opening a new chapter he hoped in African-American and continental African dialogue. Translating the message, the missionary impact on culture, which I think is arguably his most influential text, made the argument that the incarnation was the supreme act of divine crossing of frontiers, and that as a result, Christianity as a religious faith tradition lives in translation, which is by definition, he said, an act of crossing a frontier. Translating the message continues the practice of the word becoming incarnate in the flesh, he often said. All of these are important moments in Laman's frontier, frontier thinking, but the place I always found his passion to be most focused was along the frontier he encountered as an African engaging the West. It started early in his life. Chapter six of Summon from the Margin, Homecoming of an African, an autobiographical essay, tells the story of his struggle with European missionaries at the end of his teenage years. Laman had been raised a pious Muslim in an upper class family but he had found himself summoned, his word, summoned to Christian faith primarily through the person of Jesus who he first met in the Quran 
and then by the story of the suffering of God that he encountered in the Christian understanding of Jesus. Lahman called it a conversion, but when he sought to act upon his conversion and be baptized, he found both the local Roman Catholic priest and the Methodist pastor, both of them white European missionaries in his region of Gambia, unwilling to perform the sacrament due mostly to what Lahman regarded as their incredulous response to an authentic Muslim conversion in their midst. At first, he sought out baptism from the local English Methodist missionary pastor. The pastor sent him to the Roman Catholic Church in the region, suggesting it was nearer to his home. But after waiting for some time for the Roman Catholic priest to honor his conversion and baptize him, Lahman writes, he went back to the Methodist pastor to try again. Quote, my conversion was beginning to feel like managing an ecumenical hedge fund, <laughs> with the Protestants and the Catholics agreeing to share the risk of accepting a convert to, from Islam, but neither being willing to take them on alone. End of quote. Eventually, the Methodist pastor agreed to baptize the 19-year-old convert, doing so only after Lahman assured him that he was going to be going to Germany for a while and thus would be not causing an immediate problem for the pastor. And so he writes, one hot Sunday evening in June 1961, the minister set aside his scruples and administered the sacrament of baptism. I had wrung it out of him, I remember feeling. End of quote. It would not be the last time that Laman Sane wrung something of the truth out of those of us who come from the West. Encountering the West, Christianity and the global cultural process, the African dimension. Whose religion is Christianity, the gospel beyond the West? Disciples of all nations, pillars of world Christianity, each in its own way sought to continue to address that Catholic priest and that Methodist pastor from whom he had wrung his baptismal experience in 1961. Laman opposed not just what he considered to be the arrogance of the West, but what he considered to be Western Christianity's failure to embrace its own truth. He linked these two factors at a deep level, and he saw them as constituting a fundamental crisis of our era. He bristled at the notion that he was accountable for the colonial history of Western Christendom, or that he had to apologize for what Western missionaries had done, or failed to do. But at the end of the day, it was not the missionary heritage of world Christianity that he opposed, only the reduction of world Christianity to what missionaries from the West thought they were accomplishing. He often told us what missionaries intended and what converts apprehended were not the same thing. Back in October of last year, 2017, two years ago, as I was finishing my paper for last January's conference here at Princeton, the first one on world Christianity, I sent Laman an email asking him both to verify a personal conversation we had 15 years ago at Techni and to grant me permission to quote him in my paper. The comment he made that I had so vividly recalled concerning, concerned what this area of study we are calling world Christianity is all about. Sane had said to me that he thought one of the tasks of world Christianity is to challenge the tribalism that too often characterizes the work of our colleagues in the Western Academy. He emailed me back an hour later at 11 o'clock at night to confirm my recollection and give me permission to cite the conversation as reflecting his belief. Then he went on with a further reflection. He wrote that back to me this evening and I didn't have a chance to get his permission to quote this. So Laman, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. <laughs> Dear Dale, you have a good memory. I certainly concur with the sentiments you report of me. The telltale signs today are the efforts in the West to define the West out of world Christianity on the grounds that what goes for world Christianity today is different than what took place in European Christianity. And that warrants changing the name now to world Christianities. Christianity in the non-Western, Christianity in the majority world, global Christianity, and so forth. The fight about what name to give the subject is really a fight of the West and its surrogates to contest the right of Christians elsewhere to consider themselves as equals in this religion. If these converts are to be included, the West feels it must cast the deciding vote to count itself out. 
The West is happy to yield the quantitative argument of numerical growth elsewhere without budging on the qualitative ground of its intellectual and economic superiority. Despite evidence of religious recession and retreat, let's ditch the third world designation for the trouble and give Asia and Africa, among others, their statistical majority, but let's reserve for the West ultimate theological advantage. In this argument, Christianity will lose its gains and standing without the European achievement. Yet anywhere else in the world, such a cultural entitlement to the faith would be considered tribal and syncretistic. The counter move with the inclusive title World Christianity is intended to force a reckoning with this tribal view. In its historical core and course, the religion has been diverse in different and plural societies with styles, forms, and practices that are breathless in their variety and complexity. It is no different today except in scale and direction and perhaps, too, in the challenge to Western pro proprietal claims. I hope students will come to press the issue as they work to reshape the cultural landscape of the Christian profession of faith. Hmm. Laman Sane, may his anti-tribalist spirit increase and continue to inspire those of us who seek to become more truly a world Christian movement. So, Peter, you are next. Uh, I am very pleased to follow in the footsteps of the grandfather of world Christianity. <laughs> like many of you, we come to know the scholar through their works first, and only then we meet them in the flesh. And that happened to me too. The first work that I read of La Minsane was translating the message. It is from there that I realized that I had to learn a lot of new things. Now, instead of giving you a general overview evaluation of La Minsane's work, as my friend has done beautifully, I'd like to focus on his last work, uh, the famous Disciples of All Nations Pillars of World Christianity. It is his last major work before he wrote his autobiography. Now, this work uh, was part of the Oxford Studies in World Christianity. He was the generator of that series. He even asked me to write a volume for the series on Roman Catholicism. Unfortunately, time did not permit. I mean, to do that, and then the series, as far as I know, kind of died out. It is no longer in, uh, in, uh, in, in print. Now, the key to appreciate both the volume, the uh, Disciples of All Nations, and the series as a whole of which it is a part is the expression World Christianity, mentioned in the title of the book. Pillars of World Christianity. Now, at the time, World Christianity, that expression was a coinage, a new term. But today, of course, it become a currency in all kind of uh, 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 societies, scholarly societies, history, missions, and so forth. Most, most significantly for us, the way Lamin Sene used the term world Christianity is that it signals the unsettling fact that third world post-colonial Christian churches, contrary to popular perception, are no slavish replicas of the churches of the global north, but have through the process of appreciation, appropriation, and transformation, refashion the way Christianity is lived and therefore reshape the very face of Christianity. Uh, Sane put it very concisely, and I quote, Christianity has not ceased to be a Western religion, but its future as a world religion is now being formed and shaped at the hands of the minds of its non-Western students and members, unquote. Now, 
a central metaphor to understand the work of Lam Min Sene as a whole and also as in this book is, interestingly enough, the image of pillar, not so much as front juice at the beginning of his work, but as a pillar. By my counting, he uses this term at least a dozen times in this book, either preceded by an adjective such as missionary pillar, or followed by a genitive such as a pillar of charismatic renewal when he talk about African Christianity. It is crucial to note that by pillars of world Christianity, Laminsene does not mean columns supporting Christianity as the image of pillars that we see the church outside, you know, pillars. Conceived as completed and immutable building. On the contrary, Sane's basic thesis is that Christianity is a movement deeply embedded in historical and ever-evolving traditions and cultures with a series of, quote, origins, expressions, and subsequent attrition, unquote, in various parts of the world. Now, those of us who look for our textbook in church history to teach our courses, Disciples of Nation is not one of those. It is not a garden variety a kind of history of, world, of Christianity, offering a comprehensive account of the expansion of Christianity from Palestine to the other parts of the globe. Emphatically, it's not a narrative of European and North American missionaries building up churches, social services, congregations, universities, and dioceses, and so on. Rather, the book intends to illuminate the dynamic process whereby Christianity has been received and transformed by the local churches. Christianity as an imported product in terms of their languages, political and social conditions, cultures, and religions. With this aim in mind, Sane surveys the movement of Christianity from its land of its birth to the West and then from there to the rest of the world. And every time he used the word pillars is to show you that it is not accomplished, accomplished, built building, accomplished building, but it is a movement towards something new, to those new fronts. <laughs> Perhaps uh, the last chapter he uses two major missionaries as sample, as illustration of what he, he meant. He meant Roman Al Roland Allen in the Protestant tradition and the Catholic Vincent Donovan as a way of understanding what Christian mission and Christianity is. Now, the way he uses Roland Allen and uh, uh, Vincent Donovan illustrate the fundamental tenor of disciples of all nations. Though cast as historical narrative and chock full of fascinating historic information, the book is not an unbiased and natural history, neutral history of Christianity, if such a thing is at all possible, but it is an explicitly and unashamedly theological account of the Christian movement. It is informed by its author's deep conviction about God's universal presence in all cultures and about the missionary nature of Christianity as he has done in early works such as the message, transforming the message, the mission enterprise, Sane, though highly critical of the dark side of Christian missions, including their complicity with Western colonialism, and he provides ample evidence of this in this book, sternly chides secular historian and faint-hearted Christians for having ignored the immense contributions Christian missions are made to local cultures. This is one of the lessons I have learned profoundly from him. In this book, Sané elaborates at length one essential condition of such successes, and that is the willingness of the Western churches to renounce imposing their civilizations and ways of life on non-Western Christianities. 
and to enable local churches to develop their own forms of Christianity. This task is referred in recent missiological literature as indigenization or contextualization or enculturation. What is unique about Sane's work is that he backs up these theological theories with a vast array of historical data which only a, histor a historian of wide learning and deep insight just as he could do. In addition to the single achievement, three other features of Disciples of All Nations deserve mentioning. First, its conception of Christianity as world religion. After this work, it is no longer possible, historically credible, to represent Christianity as simply a Western religion. Second, its special mention of the rise and stupendous growth of the evangelical Pentecostal Christians. And third, its historiography of Christian mission, which focuses on the reception and transformation of Christianity by the local churches rather than on its Western exporters. I'd like to end this very brief, uh, my appreciation of his work by uh, remembering the, what the quotation, the final quotation, so eloquent that he has given to Dale, that we have to move beyond our tribal view of Christianity. There are many ways of looking at it, but none of, no one way is the way to understand Christianity. I think that is the legacy of Levinson. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, Funke, it's your turn. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, I didn't get to meet Lamin Sane. I never knew him but I read his works, particularly his publications on uh, African Christianity. I am a historian, and so my, my, my attraction, my main attraction to his work is his historical style, his historical depth. So I will be speaking from a historiographical perspective. Firstly, I want to talk on the way he saw the African past, especially the mission history that he was writing. He had an Afrocentric perspective. He celebrated African initiative, and I really appreciate that. Uh, because part of what I teach, I teach a course on African historiography. Um, we try to look for internal sources, for internal interpretations, to see how we can bring out some of the hidden things that Africans have done. And when I read Lamin's work, I saw a lot of this in his work. I will cite uh, a few examples. Now, he had an account of the contributions of African Americans to the abolition movement, to the spread of Christianity in Sierra Leone and Liberia. He also traced the historical roots of African Christian independence to these African Americans, the Christians and he emphasized the role of recaptives. All this I saw in his book, Abolitionists Abroad, American Blacks and the Making of Modern West Africa. And of course, there were a handful of other journal articles that explored the same theme. These uh, themes, these discussions, they are very, very pertinent to me on another level. I also teach a course on the African Independent Church Movement. And I was so fascinated by Lamin's analysis that in, treat, in, in tracing the root of these independent churches, he actually went as far 
as the activities of the African Americans. I was impressed by that, so I had to rethink my own approach to the course, and we had to incorporate some of uh, its sources too. Then, still talking about his um, Afrocentric perspective, is the significance of the vernacular scriptures that uh, several people have talked about um, as uh, expounded in his work, translating the message. He eloquently wrote about the impact of what he called the vernacular scriptures on indigenous culture that um, is not enough to just continue to propagate uh, previous um, scholarship. It challenged previous scholarship that the Christian missionary encounter in Africa oppressed the local culture, did not allow it to grow, and by emphasizing the agency of Africans themselves, particularly through the translation project, I read his work, I saw how he mentioned the activities of the re-captives that he identified as being uh, active at the formative stages of the translation project, especially in the, in the Yoruba uh, area. And then the fact that some of these people were also uh, consulted on the internal nuances of African culture while the translation work was going on, I, I, I saw that as being very, very important. Then from even my own historical research and reconstruction, we discovered that the original Bible, the first translation into Yoruba that we had in Western Nigeria, uh, I, I saw a copy of it at, um, um, at um, University of Cambridge Library. When you look at it, you discover that there are, you could actually reconstruct some of the early history of the people, I'm not talking of biblical history, because some of the words, some of the registers they used in that translation, those words are now extinct. We've had several translations of the Bible since then. And so just by sitting down to study this original translation, there is a lot that we can reconstruct about the communities at the time the Bible was translated, about their history, about the environment, the physical environment, and so many things. And these are some of the things that uh, Lamin was trying uh, to communicate uh, to us. I particularly love uh, his, his, his expression that African Christianity was not a sterile copy of, a, of its Victorian version, but that the people were free to make their own adjustments and adaptations here and there. But the beautiful thing about his thesis on the on the translation of the scriptures is that it is not just applicable to, to Africa. In any other culture where they have the Bible or the Holy Scriptures translated into their local languages, the same pattern could also be seen. Even in his work, he gave the example of um, Japan, of um, uh, India. Now, secondly, I would like to talk about his historical methodology. You see, I, I appreciate the historian in him. In terms of sources, I was amazed at his prodigious use of primary sources. He really engaged with the primary sources, and not just to, not just to extract information from them, he, he, he read the sources well. He cross-checked them, he cross-referenced them. He used one source to, to corroborate another. Missionary archives, is it Baptist archives or Methodist archives? He, he was very competent. His use of slave narratives were also expertly done. In some of my own courses too, we use some of these slave narratives, Olauda, Equano, some of them. But when I read, the, I, I had read a couple of them, but the type of information I got out for them, they were very different from what I saw in his books. So I had to go back and read those original sources again. How could I have missed all of this? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
That is what it does with, with its primary sources. And then it balances them with secondary sources. He engages the opinions of other scholars, either to affirm, to revise, or to challenge. So he is a thorough historian, very painstaking, very meticulous in his use of the historical methodology. Multidisciplinary approach. Now in history, we talk about multidisciplinary approach, so many other disciplines that we bring into to enhance our historical inter interpretation. The other discipline that I saw him engage with all the time is theology. So it's not just a historian, he's also a theologian. And you find all those things coming out uh, clearly in his work. His comparative analytical approach is also very, very impressive. When he discusses Islam and Christianity, he maintains a very good balance. He talks about the, the translation of, um, uh, of Holy Scriptures in Christianity. And then at the end of that book, he also talks, he compares it with Islam. That yes, Islam does not recommend translation of its Holy Scriptures. It's sacred. It has to be read in the original language. That one too has its own disadvantages. They still had converts. They still gained a lot of grants. Just as uh, in the Christianity on the other side, the ones that made use of the indigenous language also made their own gains. So he's able to balance his argument, even in the comparative uh, dimension. And uh, it's, not, it's not all the time that you come across scholars like that that are fully grounded in Islam, fully grounded in Christianity, and can authoritatively speak about both, both religions. I appreciate that in his, in his work. Uh, is not, his, his analyses are not monocausal. He looks for multiplicity of causes. He balances external with internal factors. And the breadth of his analysis is, 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 is also very impressive. When he talks about African Christianity, in fact, his very first work that I read, it's a journal article, The Avenger and the Redeemer, Christianity and the Cultural Matrix. For the first few pages that uh, I was reading, I was so captivated, it was a broad sweep of Africa. And then along the line, he brought in a few case studies, and I said, oh, so this is where he's going. So his, his, his mastery of, 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 of the subject is, is very, very impressive. Uh, we have heard about his contributions to the field of world Christianity, the emerging field of world Christianity. I also saw that in his work that his concern is to free Christianity from its uh, Western and imperial colorations, to allow it to, 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 to adapt to the realities in the non-Western world. And of course, issues of indigenization, he also addressed that. Uh, that is in his book, Disciples of All Nations, Pillars of World Christianity. His works have been widely reviewed, and a number of criticisms and shortcomings have been brought out by uh, academic reviewers in several journal articles. Uh, but for me, the, the, the main thing that I have taken out of his work is that celebration of African initiative, that Afrocentric perspective that, that helps us to appreciate what Africans have done for themselves. His legacy is not just in the volume of his work and in the variety of themes pursued, but in his celebration of the African agency. His insistence that we look inwards and produce internal arguments to balance the external perspective. Akitunde Akiade and uh, other colleagues have um, celebrated him with a first drift in 2010, but I think uh, we can still do another one to celebrate him, especially now that he has passed on, uh, so that uh, we can look at other dimensions of his work. And uh, by so doing, we would also uh, keep his legacy going. Thank you very much. So many thanks, Funke. Uh, Jehu, it's your turn. So I'm honored to be part of this uh, uh, illustrious panel. Uh, it's not very often that I at least get a chance to correct something that Peter Fan says, and I'm not going to pass it up. I'm sorry. Well, so, <laughs> so
So uh, uh, after uh, Disciples of All Nations, Lamin Sane published Beyond Jihad in 2016, before the... So anyway, there we go. Uh, early last December uh, uh, 2018, uh, a group of uh, uh, Christian and Muslim scholars, uh, mainly from West Africa, but also uh, from a few from different parts of the world, converged in Accra, Ghana, uh, in a meeting that was uh, uh, convened to uh, establish the framework uh, and parameters uh, for what was being called the Sane Institute uh, to be uh, uh, housed at the University uh, of Ghana, where Lamin Sane taught uh, in the in the 1970s. So the, the objective of the center uh, was to not only honor uh, uh, Sane's illustrious career, but also to continue his scholarly tradition uh, of uh, missiological and theological inquiry into Islam and Christianity in Africa and their intersections with contemporary African realities. So I was one of those present, and of course, uh, Lamin Sane was also there. And uh, I had, we hadn't seen each other for a while, so as soon as I saw him, I, I went up to him and I, you know, uh, the usual greetings, and I said to him, you know, just recently I was on a panel uh, 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 discussing the significance of, uh, of religious institutions for education in Africa, and uh, after many years, I went back to his book, his uh, 1983 uh, uh, West African Christianity, The Religious Impact, and I was sharing with him that uh, uh, once again I was uh, reminded that despite the assumption uh, that education, early education in Africa depended entirely on foreign funds and European personnel, in fact, most of the work of teaching and organization and the lion's share uh, of funding came from Africans themselves, virtually from the very beginning. Uh, the first uh, secondary school, CMS Grammar School, was established in Freetown in 1845. Uh, within two decades, it was fully self-supporting and funded uh, by, by the locals. So I was sharing this, and of course, his eyes lit up. If you know him, he had this quiet smile, and that set him off. And he started giving me all the details were not in the book about other individuals he'd research, and so we continue that conversation. Uh, of course, you look back and you think, you didn't know. I didn't know that that would be our last interaction. We spend a lot of time uh, driving through the streets of Accra, uh, discussing topics from all, ranging from one subject um, uh, to the other. Um, uh, like many others, I first uh, encountered uh, Lamin Sane in his books, and it's that book, that 1983, book, uh, West African Christianity, which I read just when I started teaching myself uh, in, in Sierra Leone. And of course, our interactions, uh, uh, my, I, I got to know him while I was a, a student at the University of Edinburgh in, in Scotland. So much of what I would like to say has been said. Let me just identify three uh, major areas, I think, uh, but Lamin Sane has left a lasting impact on African scholarship. Um, the first has to do with the traditional church history curriculum. Now, I studied under uh, Andrew Waltz, and he has made a name for challenging, uh, you know, the focus parameters of the, the, the church history curriculum, the way in which uh, uh, in most parts of the world, it strongly reflects uh, Western intellectual priorities. But uh, uh, Lamisane's voice in this conversation, in some ways, has been the most emphatic and, and the most um, uh, uh, robust. Uh, he is called very clearly, or he called very clearly for a fresh conceptualization of the field, for new adjustments. Uh, to the curriculum uh, for new interdisciplinary collaborations to refresh the way uh, the history of Christianity uh, is taught in, in theological education programs. Now, Lamin Sane would describe himself as a, as a, a, a historian of, uh, uh, of religion, but in many ways, the way he practiced, his scholarship and writings reflect quite 
definitively the social historian. Uh, and, and for me, uh, because I view myself as a social historian, that's one area where his, his writings have had a, 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 a tremendous impact. This effort to understand the whole of uh, society and integrate the experiences of the underrepresented, neglected groups into how we tell uh, the, 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 the Christian story. He criticized what he called the top-down view of God uh, in much of what uh, uh, we read in, in the history of the church. And uh, uh, he called for new approaches that take, took on the entire landscape uh, of the emergent world Christianity with its roots among workers, peasants, refugees, immigrants, the underclass, and so on, because their voices were uh, uh, critical uh, to the story. In fact, in, in one of his writings, he suggests that, I quote, the historian's business is to do the best for the other side, which is the underside, to resist the force of the West's claim, claims to primacy, unquote. So this, this uh, approach to the, the church's curriculum was profound, but profoundly important for telling the story of African Christianity. Um, I believe many of you know that to this day, uh, there are still widespread assumptions uh, shared by even Africans that the church in Africa is largely a Western product. And, um, uh, of course, this has been re rebutted and, and refuted in so many uh, uh, different ways. But let me say I had one particular argument that I always go to uh, when I introduce uh, 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 my classes in, in the history of African Christianity. He made the point that the same verdict is seldom applied to Islam, by which he, <laughs> by which he meant that the same processes of change uh, uh, subjected to different standards of, of uh, judgment. The African embrace of the Christian faith uh, is often deemed ill-informed or borrowed or derived or an imitation of Western uh, forms, while the spread of Islam uh, is often seen as intrinsic, as uh, 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 free from any external impositions. And, and uh, it, it was his way of querying uh, uh, some of the duplicities we find uh, in, the, in the scholarship. Mention has been made of his uh, heavy contribution to the salience of indigenous uh, religiosity. And I think there are few who have done more uh, to expose the fact that the judgment that African Christianity is raised on foreign stock ignores the dynamics of religious change and the enduring potency of religious elements. This story of pre-existing religious uh, 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 traditions, the way they shape uh, African engagement with the faith, the way they fundamentally inform uh, reception and appropriation uh, is now a hallmark of uh, uh, world uh, Christianity uh, studies. As Lamin Sane puts it in one of his most quotable quotes, and there are many of those, but there is one where he says, I quote, indigenous discovery of Christianity requires even more critical attention than the Christian discovery of indigenous societies, unquote. So, and you know, and he of course uh, uh, has expanded widely on the principles of translation and indigenous uh, 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 appropriation that conversion in Africa was no passive uh, uh, process, that the new understandings and initiatives that emerged out of African appropriation of the faith combined critique of missionaries uh, with radical reform uh, using uh, instruments of indigenous uh, uh, religion. So these two foci, local agency and the translation uh, principle that privileged the recipients and uh, demonstrates that uh, people reach salvation through their own culture and emphasizes uh, that uh, in the spread of the gospel, the recipient culture is a valid site and should be in some ways a primary focus of a scholarship. Again, is now simply part of how we think and, and study uh, uh, world, Christ world Christianity. And I have to say, 
this vernacular issue that he has used to complicate you know, the Western missionary mandate is one that I find resonates throughout the history of Christianity. There's a tendency in our studies of world Christianity to think of uh, these arguments, these ideas and insights as kind of applicable to post 16th century realities. And I find in my own work and, and research that uh, through, you can apply these same particular uh, insights and arguments throughout the history uh, of, of, of uh, Christianity with great prophets. But finally, I think um, we have to state here that Lamin Sane was one of the leading architects of world Christianity as a new area of discourse. Now, of course, he was a, a prominent uh, 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 Christian scholar, but also a world-class scholar uh, of Islam, uh, one whose uh, 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 expansive studies and writings uh, not only included transnational uh, movements, but the interdisciplinarity that he often um, emphasized. I have to say that I don't know whether this is the experience of others in the room, uh, reading Lamin Sane for the first time can be a bit much <laughs> for graduate students. I don't know if I can get an amen to that. <laughs> it takes them a while to get into his rhythm, into the, into the cadence of his ideas, the way he uses words and language, and, and the subtleties. So, sometimes it can be so subtle that the idea hits you long after you've you know, stopped reading. Uh, the subtleties of, of, his, uh, of his scholarship. I have to agree. I think disciples of all nations uh, present his most comprehensive uh, assessment and critique uh, of the way we study Christianity and uh, uh, approaching it from a world Christianity uh, perspective. Uh, when you read it carefully and you read it again, you begin to see the layers of subversiveness uh, in his in his arguments and the revisionist nature of, of, uh, of, of, his, um, of uh, his, his insights. Um, he also critiques world Christianity in the, in the volume, if you're reading it uh, carefully. He wonders whether um, the unrelenting efforts to export Western forms of the Christian faith to non-Western societies, the, 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 the assiduous uh, uh, implacable drive to insist on a Western version, uh, whether that means that world Christianity comes to embody a Western form, and whether the, the thinking around it will remain captive uh, to these uh, uh, impressions and, and exploits. He wonders, but he doesn't give in to any, uh, he doesn't give an inch to the idea that, yes, uh, world Christianity will end up in that sort of uh, uh, captivity. Friends, uh, Sanez's penetrating and magisterial scholarship has helped to set the stage for new approaches and analytical concepts that have been adopted by scholars of Christianity worldwide. Uh, we now attend to certain issues, uh, to certain topics, to certain ideas, uh, because of his, uh, of his legacy. He did have blind spots. Some might say he could have paid more attention to women in his, in his writings. Um, and because we are at a conference of this nature, you might say, well, he, he was not an ethnographer, and he did not really uh, engage the fruits and, and the particular uh, 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 substance and, and, and contributions that might be made. But he remains a giant among us because of, because of what he did produce and provide. Before I sit down, let me say this, uh, and I, I speak as an African now. Uh, well, I've been speaking as an African, but <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I, want to, I want to get your attention just for one minute. Um, in the last 11 years, we've lost three of the most dominant and influential Africans. And we've lost them 
at the height, they're not winning, they're not, you know, fading. Uh, we lost them at the height of their uh, monumental intellectual powers. It was uh, Kwame Bediako uh, in 2008, and then Obukalu in 2009, and uh, Lamin Sane, uh, 2019. And when I, when I got the news of his passing, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Not again. Thank you. Thank you, Jehu. So, Shobana? Um, good afternoon. I'm also very honored to be a part of this remembrance. Um, and I'm speaking as, uh, like many others, someone who read his work and then I was able to uh, have the opportunity to meet him and um, continue being inspired by him uh, at conferences. Uh, and we shared, it was because of him that I became so interested in uh, not only Christian Muslim relationships, but also West Africa as a locus of pluralism, as the place where, you, as a place to study the world. And in fact, I would just want for a few minutes to reminisce about how I first studied his work in a global history class, not a class on Christianity or religion, but on history. Um, and was his name was maybe the only African name um, on a s otherwise uh, largely white male uh, syllabus uh, because it's usually not Africans, Asians, or Latin Americans who are writing, were writing global history at that time. So reading his work shifted my orientation um, or, or made my orientation to understand world history from West Africa. Uh, uh, so I, I want to focus uh, a little bit more on his methodology, as Fouke also addressed, uh, because actually this semester, I'm what I'm trying to do is teach global history to my students through mission history. And what I would see is partly related to what uh, uh, La Minsana's mission himself itself was, uh, and I've and it's and it's impossible to have a class like that. This is for undergraduates without his work on it. Uh, I, I found, and so the two books that I chose were actually translating the message and um, abolitionists abroad. And maybe as Jehu mentioned, a bit heavy for the undergrads. Uh, it is bre the, the writing is breathtaking. Um, the insight is breathtaking because it makes them pause and not be able to keep moving on reading as if they're understanding. They have to stop and understand. Um, so I just wanted to make a, a, a few comments about these, these works. Um, the first is that um, of all the other readings we've had about the idea of cultural imperialism being associated with missions, the way he takes that idea apart in such an understated and graceful way is actually breath breathtaking in translating the message. Um, that uh, cr Christianity's revolution was multifold um, and that the, the, the very notion that um, Christian Christian missions were, could be reduced to cultural imperialism, uh, which is still how many popular images of Christian missions are. If we think about how, for example, uh, John Chow was represented in what happened in the in the um, in the Andaman Islands recently, um, which is what my students came to the class with. Uh, Lamin's discussion of it is so understated, and he takes it apart, and he brings in translating the message, the idea of. Um, communicating the message to the very personal level. And I think this is another aspect of his work that is so breathtaking is it, because of his own experiences, he brings that level of, um, of individual cognition and faith to his scholarly writing. And so he talks about, for example, um, uh, the, the breakthrough that Paul has, um, that, the, that the idea of cultural exclusion was completely shattered for him. And on, he said, he, write, he wrote, 
uh, encountering the reality of God beyond the inherited terms of one's culture reduces the reliance of that person on that culture as a universal normative pattern. Um, just to meditate on that idea that we, we uh, as individuals have to break beyond our inherited terms was something that I personally was affected by and that my students, I was getting them to sort of think about what what Laman would be saying to them if he was actually in the classroom. What are your inherited patterns of thought um, and, and belief? Um, uh, just moving on quickly so we have time to discuss, Abolitionists Abroad is um, a, a also a revolutionary book in so many ways. But to, as Funke mentioned, his, his discussion, uh, his bringing to life uh, Equiano and Crowther and other uh, Africans, particularly African freed slaves, as intellectuals is something that my students needed to need to understand now, and that our f future students should be reading over and over again. Um, he 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 again brings Equiano's personal uh, revelation to um, it, to life in details. Uh, writing Equiano was fixated on the gap between the virtues of humanity preached by religion and the evils of real life. Being an abolitionist and missionary meant con being continually reminding people others of this moral possibility. And we read Equiano in so many registers, but as Funke said, the, to, to have students read Equiano and then read uh, Laman's uh, work to, to see um, that Equiano's impact w is a global impact on the, um, the condition of slavery as much as the impact of Rousseau or Montesquieu or any other thinker, and so to, uh, the, the genius of his work for me was to, and, and is, and to impress upon students this idea of who is, who is an intellectual um, and why aren't more African scholars, thinkers, uh, uh, men and women like Equiano and Crowther studied and talked about as intellectuals. And this is something that I've become very interested in is intellectual history and the, what that actually uh, means. And so I would add to the long list of what Laman Sana represents is he is also an intellectual historian uh, who, sh who, who um, histor intellectual historians should be reading. Uh, Abolitionists Abroad also strikes me as revolutionary as a book for our time and particularly to reflect on what America is today. The way he talks about the origins of Sierra Leone and Liberia, I had, I've, I had never read um, that kind of treatment of uh, the, the, the idea of black colonization. Um, and it's very different roots in the Sierra Leonean tradition versus the Liberian tradition and uh, Laman really helps explain why those two nations' histories were, f were so different in their founding, in part because of the very different tap roots they had in the United States. Um, but it also made me think about reading this book today, um, what America did, represented in the world then, uh, 200 years ago, or, and what America represents in the world today. And again, to my students, impressing upon them that many of the beautiful aspects of what a American philosophy or politics were or is have originated in Africa. Uh, and so to go back to a point that's been made, and this will just be my conclusion, is that it, global history has, should, must take keep absorbing the work of La Manzana, as well as Atlantic history. Um, so bringing together the fields of Christian, glo uh, world Christianity, but Atlantic history and global history, this is, I think, a way, and American history, we may think about future possibilities. Thank you.